can I declare the meeting open to the public and welcome members. Um, we'll just wait until any members of the public come in before I read the <coughs> protocol for that. Then we'll start off. Um, can I just remind members of the public to switch off all mobile phones? Um, you're more than welcome to use our Wi-Fi, and I think the Wi-Fi code is down there somewhere. Um, can I also remind uh, members of the public that um, taking photographs and recording is strictly prohibited, and also remind members if they can um, turn their mobile phones off or onto silent, and maybe move them off the, the table in order for the not to interfere with the uh, recording equipment. Um, so moving on then to item number one, apologies, everybody's present, I take it, yes they are, okay. Can I move on then to item number two, which is the draft minutes, and can I refer members to the draft minutes on page seven of your meeting pack? Um, can I ask members, are they content with the minutes of the 20th of January 2020 as drafted? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, members. Move on, on then to item number three, which is matters of matters arising. And just say that follow on from last week's discussion um, on HMO regulations, members will be aware that the clerk wrote to the department seeking additional information. Um, subsequently, he has also written to Belfast City Council, which is the lead council on the HMO delivery model, inviting their representative to brief the committee at the meeting on the 6th of February. Um, the clerk has also suggested that the Belfast representative may also wish to extend the invitation to Causeway Coast and Cleanse. Borough Council and Derry City and Strabane District Council, which act as sub-regional lead councils. Um, the aim of the briefing is to clarify the issues raised by members at last week's meeting, which relate <coughs> primarily to the implementation of the regulations. Um, can I also, uh, any comment on that first of all, to do with no. that? No, that's fine. Um, can I also um, advise the members that along with the Deputy Chair, uh, we met with the Minister on Monday, for it was quite an informal chat, um, where uh, we discussed issues that were um, of, of importance, um, such as the reclassification of housing, the welfare mitigations, the housing executive, arm's length bodies, um, the various strategies. It was it was an informal meeting. Um, there was only just the three of us in the room. Um, so it was just for us to relay our thoughts and views to the Minister and for her to, uh, to come back with some information um, with us. Anything further you want to add to that, Kelly? Or? I think I just was very impressed that the Minister is looking forward to working with the committee. Okay. So, okay. Working relationship. Johnny, you'd wanted to come in then, yeah. Andy? Yeah, just, uh, just probably follow on from that point, and I know on page 11.12 the committee had agreed to invite the Minister to brief the committee. Uh, I, I note since our last meeting, um, the Justice Committee and indeed the Agriculture Com uh, Committee, both Ministers have supplied unredacted versions and copies of their first day brief. I think that would be helpful for the committee as soon as possible, uh, that we would be provided with that as well. So I would make that a formal proposal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Andy? Yes, Chair. Can I just clarify in respect, I know it was an informal meeting with yeah. the Minister and you may not be able to clarify at this point, but was there any clarity given around the sub-regional um, stadium programme in terms of a consultation? No, that we didn't have that information, okay. um, but uh, we can certainly go back with that information and ask for it. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of ambiguity out there I mean, yeah. amongst uh, the football fraternity uh, as right, to yeah. the way forward. Yeah, I know, because uh, I've been contacted also by the football fraternity around that, mm -hmm. so I know the issues, yeah. um, but I would imagine that um, we will be finding out um, just exactly where they sit on that. Okay, thank you, Andy. Okay, can I move on to item number four, which then is correspondence and refer members to the memo on page 23 of the meeting packs. Can I ask if members are content to action all the correspondence outlined? Great. Agreed. Thank you very much. Then we'll move on to uh, the fun part. Um, item number five, which is consideration of statutory rules. Um, members, the next item on the agenda um, we, uh, is the consideration of statutory rules. And before I invite officials to the table, I'd like to clarify the process that we'll adopt today. In your pack, you've been provided with 72 
statutory rules which have been laid over the last couple of years. Um, these include a significant number of rules that were subject to the confirmatory procedure, which applies mostly to the regulations relating to Social Security benefits. As members are aware, confirmatory regulations, once laid, cease to have force unless confirmed by the Assembly within six months. Uh, the approach the Department has taken to such regulations as this date uh, for each approached was to revoke the regulation and then relay them. So uh, good news there is while there are quite a, a number of these regulations in the pack, we only have to consider the current regulations. Um, in addition, um, as I hope Jane and Janice will soon explain, why there are quite a number of regulations relating to social security matters that are subject to the confirmatory procedures. Um, these have been subsumed uh, into three key regulations, which we will be dealing with first but I'll let the officials um, explain that to you further. Um, to ensure clarity in our consideration of the regulations, the clerk has worked closely with the department over the last few weeks so that we are almost quite liter literally looking at the same information in front of us. Um, you will each have a document that gives the names of the officials, who will brief the committee and on what regulations. The paper also details the order the regulations will be taken and where you can find them near PAC. Okay, is that all clear? Mm -hmm. Yep, good, okay. So uh, therefore there's a total of 43 rules to consider. So we might get through these in one sitting. If things go a little slower, um, perhaps if members are in agreement, we could break for a short comfort break um, uh, before we begin the pe pension regulations. Remember, agree with that? Okay. Right, we're nearly there. Um, just before we begin, two more rules have been added in the last couple of days, and you have these in your tabled items. These come under the pension regulations, which we are not considering until later in the meeting. So perhaps we can just we can leave those for the time being. I just want to draw members' attention to that. Lastly, the Director of Social Security Policy and Legislation Division, Anne McCleary, had planned to attend today's meeting to give the committee an overview of the different policy offer, 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 uh, of the different policy areas covered uh, by her division, but she's been called away to a meeting with the Minister. So uh, if members are content with all of that, can I invite Jane Corduroy and Janice Crane to the table to begin our briefings? Okay, um, just to ask Jane and Jack, sorry, do you want to bring, say sorry, something first? Sorry, I just wanted to say, I'm very sorry I should have brought this up earlier with you. Um, I'm going to have to drop out at about 25 past 10, just for half an hour for an assembly business meeting. Not a problem. No problem. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, Jane and Janice, you're very welcome. Um, and uh, if you could, when you're doing your briefing to the committee, be clear as to which regulations the briefing relates, um, because it's it can get a little bit confusing with so many of them. And if you could just um, uh, let us know if you're going to cover more than one regulation um, through the briefings. Okay, so I'm going to ask us then to move to the first statutory rules which relate to agenda items five, seven and nine. And if that's okay, and we can take those together. Um, as chairs outlined, Janice and I are going to be talking about the operating package, a miscellaneous set of regulations and regulations relating to amendments to industrial injuries. Um, as background to the operating, each year the rates of certain social security benefits, pensions and lump sum payments are reviewed and usually operate in the April. The legislation that provides for the increase in the rates is known as the operating package. The operating package consists of a series of statutory rules for the current 29 package and they are Item, agenda item 5, 7 and 9, so there's Statutory Rule 2019, number 188, which is the Social Security Benefits Operating, number 2, Order, Northern Ireland 2019, Statutory Rule 2019, number 189, the Social Security Benefits Operating, number 2, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, which is agenda item number 7, and Statutory Rule 2019, number 187, the Mesothelioma Lump Sum Payments Conditions and Points Amendment number 2, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, which is agenda item number 9. Um, and because they're all interrelated, I'll just talk through all three of them. Um, the first of these is the Social Security Benefits Operating number 2, Order, Northern Ireland 2019, um, which is agenda item number 5. The order provides for the increase in rates of certain Social Security benefits, pensions and allowances and for these rates that were in place for April 2019 to continue in force. 
the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions in Great Britain is required by law to review certain contributory, non-contributory and extra cost disability benefits each year and to operate them at least in line with the increase in the general level of prices. And therefore, these benefits were operated by 2.4% in 2019. State pension and some other benefits must be reviewed and operated by at least as much as increase in the level of earnings. In addition, the UK Government made a commitment to the triple lock, where the basic and new state pension are operated by the highest of the increase in earnings, the increase in price, or 2.5%. The 2019 operating package uses as its basis the September figure for the annual <coughs> from the consumer price index, which was 2.4% and the May to July figure for the growth in average weekly earnings, which was 2.6%. And the order therefore includes a 2.6% increase in 2019 to the basic, basic and new state pension. The Westminster Government announced in the summer budget of 2015 that certain social security benefits would be frozen for four tax years. This phrase is due to come to an end this April. For clarity, when the Secretary of State makes an operating order for Great Britain, the Department for Communities is empowered only to make a corresponding order for Northern Ireland. The Department has no power to set different rates of benefits and pensions for Northern Ireland in the annual operating order. Um, the second set then is the Social Security Benefits Operating Number 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, which is SR 2019 number 189, which is agenda item number 7. Um, some technical provisions in relation to operating cannot be included in the operating order and therefore a set of operating regulations is also included in the package. These make technical amendments that are required for the correct implementation of the increased rates. For 2019, <coughs> these regulations also included the increase to the carers allowance earnings limit, which was made as a separate statutory rule in previous years. So the separate 2018 and 2017 statutory rules in respect of this, that's SR 2018-50 and SR 2017 number 67, which I don't think are an agenda item, have been revoked and the current provision is included in operating regulations um, SR 2019 number 189, which is agenda item number 7. Okay. Um, the third uh, statutory rule in the operating package is the mesothelioma lump sum payments, conditions and amounts. Amendment number two, Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, which is SR 2019 number 187, and it's agenda item nine. The mesothelioma regulations increase the amounts payable under the Mesothelioma Act to people who have been disabled through an asbestos-related disease. Although there is no statutory obligation under the legislation to increase the level of these payments, they were increased by 2.4% in line with the increase in prices to reflect similar increase in other disability benefits. The implementation of the entire 2019 operating package was expected to have increased the Department's annually managed expenditure by approximately £110 million. Pounds. This money comes directly from Treasury and does not come out of the Northern Ireland Block Grant. Um, in total, the Department of Communities pays out approximately £6 billion pounds in benefits and pensions each year. These three SRs are subject to the confirmatory procedure, which, as you know, means they would cease to have effect after six months unless they are approved by a resolution of the Assembly. The operating order is also cross-cutting with the Department for the Economy. Um, therefore, debates on these, we hope, will be scheduled in the Assembly in March this year. As it was not possible for the SRs in the operating package made for April 2019 to be approved by the Assembly within the six-month timescale, these number two statutory rules before committee this morning were made in September and the previous SRs, um, numbers 57, 58 and 59, have been revoked. Uh, this has been the case since the Assembly fell in 2017 and the relevant operating package has been revoked and remade twice each year to ensure there has been statutory provision to pay benefits, pension and lump sum payments here at the increased rates. Um, I have a list of all the SRs that were revoked, all the numbers would do. Okay. <laughs> so there, there are nine SRs that were revoked in 2017 and um, nine yeah, in 2018. And the current package before the committee today at agenda items five, seven and nine are the only current set and they'll require approval by the Assembly before the 26th of March this year. Um, in normal circumstances, the Department would not have sought to remake confirmatory regulations on a rolling basis like this. However, the Department was seeking to act in the public interest to try to ensure that the Social Security system could continue to function. Had the Department not done this, and if the operating package had not been made and revoked and remade each year, 
benefit rates here would legally have been frozen at the 2016 levels. Okay, thank you very much. Members, any questions on any of that? Kelly? I have no difficulty with the uplifts, but there's something in this that confuses me completely. Um, in, in 188, um, it talks about the amounts of uplift, and I go in particular to, I think it's page 22 of, of the regulations, 81 on our pack, um, where it, it talks about um, you know, the payments of disability premium. But it talks about polygamous marriages. I'm imagining that's been lifted across from DWP, but they're not legal in Northern Ireland. So I just, when I read that, I went, what? So when you go to um, 8, B, yeah, for I instance, was, yeah. page 22, paragraph C. Yeah, it's mentioned a few times. Yeah. <coughs> well, there, yeah. I think it, I think it was added in about, about, about the 2014 or 2015 okay. set. Um, it was in relation to something in GB, but it was something that we added in. We can so it's just cr copied across. But it was just I just wondered, was there something that we didn't know about going on? No, no. <laughs> no but I think it was actively added in. But we can send a bit more detail about that if that's... Yeah, but the detail of, of the uplifts, to be honest, that's great. I just wondered, uh, I take it that's just come across from GB and it's gone straight into ours. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. I know. Yeah. All right, members, I will then start then with agenda, yeah, agenda item 5, SR 2019-188, the Social Security Benefits Upgrading Number 2 Order, Northern Ireland 2019. Can I ask members if they have any objection to the rule? No. no. Okay, then I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-188, the Social Security Benefits Upgrading Number 2 Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Moving on then to Agenda Item 7, SR 2019-189, the Social Security Benefits Upgrading Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. Can I ask, um, are there any objections to the rule? No. 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 Then I'll read as follows, that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-189, the Social Security Benefits Upgrading Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Moving on then to agenda item number nine, SR 2019-187, the mesothelioma lump sum payments, conditions and amounts amendment number two, regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Have members any objection to the rule? No. no. Okay, then I'll put the following question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-187, the mesothelioma Mesothelioma. Mesothelioma. <laughs> Lump sum payments, conditions and amounts, Amendment Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Thankfully, I only have to say that once during this meeting, but when we go to the Assembly, I'll maybe have to say it several times. <laughs> so, okay, so we've now completed those. So we're going to move on then to agenda items 31, 32, 33, and 34. Um, and then ask you to go ahead. Okay, these are negative resolutions and they're parity measures. I'm going to talk to agenda item number 31 and then Janice is going to lead on the free industrial injuries amendments. Um, Statute Rule 2017 number 218, which is the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendment number 2 regulations at uh, Northern Ireland 27, um, makes technical amendments to several sets of regulations to make minor corrections or clarify the existing provisions to ensure the legislation reflects current practice and the policy intent. For extra cost disability benefits like attendance allowance and disability living allowance, along with carers allowance, there is a past present test which requires a person to spend two out of the last three years in Northern Ireland. These regulations made amendments to allow refugees and their families to claim extra costs, disability benefits, <coughs> once they have been granted refugee status or humanitarian protection, rather than having to wait until they also satisfy the criteria set out by the past present tense. The regulations also make amendments to income-related benefits legislation to put beyond doubt the treatment of state pension to avoid uncertainty <coughs> about how notional income should be calculated following the introduction of pension flexibilities. Minor consequential changes were also included to reflect the increase in the age at which entitlement to widow pen widow's pension ends. This was age 65, but is now linked to state pension age. A minor drafting error was corrected to ensure that decisions and appeals legislation reflects the policy intent in relation to the extension period for an in-time application for mandatory consideration, along with a minor am amendment to interpretation provisions to ensure that people get the full intended period to request a reconsideration. 
Another minor amendment clarified that only one individual is to be awarded a specified adult childcare credit in any one week, and a minor consequential amendment was made to include personal independence payment in the overlapping benefit provisions. These were all technical amendments to various sets of regulations to ensure the legislation reflected the policy intent and works in practice. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, the department made three sets of regulations. Sorry, just one moment. Sorry, just done. Sorry, Dean. Um, issue with this. Just, just it's maybe a wee query around the past presence test itself. Though that's a, a party thing, isn't it? So it's the same here as yes. across, across the water, and we have no scope to diverge or digress from that. Um. It wouldn't be for these regulations, it would be in the yeah, personal pet time. I'm a more general thing um, that I haven't been on this committee of social development for, for a long time. I, I think my time on it preceded the past presence test, but it's just implications that has not solely for refugees or people coming from here who, who don't come uh, from here, but given that so many people have left these shores for the past number of years to find work. Uh, it has profound implications for them who might have to return home. Caring responsibilities or anything like that, no? Um, we, there are some situations where a person can be treated as being present in Northern Ireland for the purpose of the past present test. And um, it's, for example, an EEA country or a family member of an EEA national and have come from another EEA country, so that would cover most of Europe and a bit beyond, yeah. Okay, cool. okay. Any other questions on that, sorry? I should have asked. No, sorry, Janice, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Department made three sets of regulations in relation to industrial injuries over the past three years. So it's um, <coughs> uh, 2017, number 45, uh, 2018, number 151, and 2019, number 204, agenda items 32, 33, and 34. Uh, these are all subject to negative resolution. Um, as a background, they all amend the 1986 Principal Industrial Injuries Prescribed Disease Regulations. Uh, the Industrial Injury Scheme provides non-contributory non benefits for employed earners who are disabled by accidents or prescribed disease arising out of and of in the course of their employment. Industrial Injuries Disablement Benefit compensates the person involved for a loss of faculty which results in disablement on a no-fault basis and is paid according to the degree of disablement. The Industrial Injuries Advisory Council is an independent statutory body which advises the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and DB and the Department of Communities on matters relating to the Industrial Injuries Scheme. In particular, having studied the scientific evidence, the Council advises which diseases should be prescribed or amended for the purposes of claims for Industrial Injuries Disabled Benefit. This includes reviewing and recommending changes to the prescription of diseases. In order for a disease to be prescribed, the disease must be one which can be considered to have been caused by the nature of the person's employment. If I could take then just the 2017 amendments. First, that's SR 2017, number 45, at agenda item 34. It implemented the recommendations of the Council set out in the Council's reports published during 2016 regarding cancers due to ionisation ionizing radiation, diffuse pleural thickening and extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Three prescribed diseases were updated and a new disease was added to the list. Then the 2018 regulations, um, SR 2018 number 151, at agenda item 33. It made amendments to ensure that the scheme reflected up-to-date scientific knowledge by extending the eligibility criteria for prescribed disease, latex, anaphylaxis, and nasal carcinoma. Um, in 2019, then 2019 SR number 204 at agenda item 32. It implemented IAC's recommendations that Jupitron's contracture, which affects the digits of the hand, arising from work for 10 years or more, involving the use of handheld part tools, should be prescribed as a disease, which, which is presumed to be due to the nature of a person's em employment. So all these changes uh, ensure the list of prescribed diseases stays up to date in terms of scientific knowledge. Thank you very much, well said. <laughs> Any questions, members? No. Chair, could I just ask? Yes. Uh, the, the illnesses that are due to handheld tools, uh, would they be like Kango hammers and things of that nature? That's yes. the type of. Yes. Okay, that's okay. fine, Chair. All right, thank you.
Okay, members, then we'll move to the regulations and we'll go to agenda item 31, SR 2017-218, the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendment No. 2 Regulation, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to that rule? No. Okay, then, um, I'm losing my page. There I am here. Um, then I'll read that the Committee for the Communities has considered SR 2017-218, the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendments No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Move on then to item Agenda 32, SR 2019-204, the Social Security Industrial Injuries Prescribed Diseases Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Can I ask members if there any objection to this rule? No. No. I'll then read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-204, the Social Security Industrial Injuries Prescribed Diseases Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Then on to agenda item 33, SR 2018-151, the Social Security Industrial Injuries Prescribed Diseases Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. Can I ask members of any objection to this rule? No. Then I'll read as follows that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-151, the Social Security Industrial Injuries Prescribed Diseases Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. We then move on to Agenda Item 34, which is SR 2017-45, the Social Security Industrial Injuries Prescribed Diseases Amendment <coughs> Regulation, Northern Ireland 2017. Uh, any member, any objection to the rule? No. no. I'll then read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-45, the Social Security Industrial Injuries Prescribed Diseases Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Support, has no objection to the rule. Okay, that then concludes our first set of regulations. Can I thank Jane and Janice? and um, appreciate your time and coming to committee. Thank you. <coughs> Then I'd like then to invite uh, John Noble, Gillian Wright and Paul McKenna to the table. <coughs> Yeah. Good morning. Okay. Yes, apologies. Jill is unwell today, so you're quite okay. she cannot be here. Um, you're here to brief the committee on statutory rules relating to social security claims, payments and fines, and also the social fund. Um, we will take one briefing on the first two, which are the same regulation, but which reference different years. And these are agenda items 35 and 36. We will then move on to the regulation relating to fine deductions at agenda item 37. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm going to cover agenda item 35, uh, Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. Um, the statutory rule amends the Social Security Claims and Payments Regulations, uh, Northern Ireland 1987 and the Universal Credit Personal Independence Payment, Job Seekers <coughs> Alliance and Employment and Support Alliance Claims and Payments Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2016, to decrease from 44 pence to 39 pence the fee which qualifying lenders pay for the purpose of defraying administrative expenses incurred by the department in making payments in respect of mortgage interest direct to those lenders. Um, by way of background, benefit claimants are helped with their mortgage interest payments through support for uh, mortgage interest. Uh, SMI is paid as part of income support, income based job seekers allowance, income related employment and support allowance, state pension credit and once introduced in Northern Ireland um, with universal credit. Um, I should actually advise that these provisions of this instrument have actually since been superseded by the provisions of Schedule 5 to the Loans for Mortgage Interest Regulations Northern Ireland 2017 which was statutory rule uh, 2017. Uh, number 176. Um, 
those regulations were actually made on our behalf by the Department for Work and Pensions as they were made under the powers of the Welfare Reform and Work Northern Ireland Order 2016. Those, per sorry, those powers are currently exercised by the Secretary of State. Uh, moving on to um, agenda item number 36, um, Statutory Rule 2018 number 172. Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. Uh, the purpose of the statutory rule was to extend the maximum time limit for making a claim for a Sure Start Maternity Grant uh, from three months to six months. Uh, by way of background, the Sure Start Maternity Grant is a payment of £500 to provide help with the cost of a baby or babies in the event of a multiple birth, expected, born, adopted or the subject of a parental or residence order or other similar arrangements. It is normally paid only uh, if there are no other children under the age of 16 in the claimant's family, the only exception being in the case of a subsequent multiple birth or a kinship care arrangement. Okay. okay. Uh, members, have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Sinead. Go ahead. Go for it. You see the, um, the payment of £500 uh, for the event of one or multiple births. Does it go up? Does it increase any for a multiple birth or does it stay the same? No, it's just the same amount. Why, why is that? That's just the policy, policy decision we've had in place here in Northern Ireland. Okay, that might be something then that we want to discuss further at a, uh, whenever we're, we're looking at this going forward. Yeah, Carol? And the other issue around um, the <coughs> Secretary's date for work and pensions taking the room. When does that transfer over? Does that become, because it's a devolved matter now, what happens now? Um, I assume the talk department obviously will they have discussions with DWP about getting the parts transferred back. If obviously the Assembly agree to that. But does it not happen automatically that there's a minister in place? No, I believe we need uh, legislation to transfer it back. I right. believe, yeah. Just need to get clarification on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There was a minister in place, Chairman, we actually gave the powers away. Yeah. Okay, well, I will get, we'll, we'll get more clarity on that. That's fine. Anything so they're the welfare-related, welfare reform-related welfare powers we would have classed them as, that, but we have other powers that we would have made legislation under that aren't specifically related to welfare reform. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like there's going to be quite a lot of them then. We just need to find out if the department can just lay out which are devolved and which are not, because you know, people I'd say don't know that. They think we've got full yeah, possession of all yeah. of all matters in relation to benefits and pensions and we just need to work out if you, you can tell us which are responsibility of the department and then which are responsibility of DWP. I think it would be helpful for us all. Yeah, well then we'll, yeah, we'll we get that yeah. sent yeah, to us then. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Any other questions no. around Items number 35 and 36, no? No. Okay. Well, then I'd proceed with item, agenda item 35, SR 2017-49, the Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulation, Northern Ireland 2017. Any members have any objections to this rule? Nope. Okay, then I'll read as follows that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-49, the Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2017 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules has no objection to the rule. Did I read that right or do I need to read that again? Okay, sorry, I do need to read it again. That the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-49, the Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Just bear with me, members. There's no worries. Okay. Item agenda number 36, which is SR 2018-172, the Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulation, Northern Ireland 2018. Any objections to this rule? No. Okay. Then I'll read as follows. That the Committee for Communities has considered... SR 2018-172, the Social Security Claims and Payments Amendment Regulation of Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rules. Okay, thank you. We'll move on then to Agenda Item 37. 
Okay, agenda item 37 is statutory rule 2018 number 98, Social Security fines, deductions from benefits regulations in Northern Ireland 2018. Um, this statutory rule provides for deductions to be made from income support, state pension uh, credit, job seekers allowance or employment and support allowance where a fine or compensation order has been imposed upon a person, um, the offender, by a court to meet the sums due in respect of such fines and compensation orders. Uh, it should be noted that this does not include universal credit, uh, as at the time when the Department of Justice um, was taking this uh, legislation, or sorry, their act forward, um, universal credit wasn't actually on the list of prescribed benefits at that time, and it wasn't a live benefit. Um, just by way of background, the Justice Act Northern Ireland 2016 provided the statutory basis for the introduction of the recovery of court fines via deductions from benefits uh, brought forward through um, these uh, statutory rules. This is a cross-cutting policy, prim primarily owned by and operated by the Department of Justice. However, the regulations do bring Northern Ireland into line uh, with GB. Um, part 1 of the Justice Act Northern Ireland 2016 created an entirely new regime for the collection and enforcement of financial penalties. Um, it created collection officers whose function was to operate and enforce collection orders as imposed by the courts. Um, the Department will be seeking uh, in the near future direction from the Department of Justice regarding any intention and timeline for the amending of the Justice Act to include universal uh, credit. Okay, thank you. Carl? Oh, sorry, have you finished there? Yes, sorry. Uh, sorry. Carl? Um, so the question I have is, say for example, a fine was imposed on someone and it's been deducted from their benefit. So if it's been deducted from their benefit and they are this they claim behalf mm -hmm. of their family, it's effectively their family who are being penalised rather than an individual? No, I said actually universal. It, it doesn't actually include universal in, in this process at the moment. Okay. It's only for this, um, the le old legacy benefits, like JSA, so, etc. So are you saying that people who are living together or as a civil partnership are married all came separately, even as a married couple? Um. No, I don't think so. It's a joint claim. It is a joint claim. I'm not trying to trick you up. It's just yeah. that we, what we want to make sure, I'm sure we all want to make sure that um, the rule of the universal credit is one thing, but there are families who claim as a family unit for benefits for the lot. And if it's the male or the female who's in possession or who's, who's getting convicted, then the entire family should not be you know, disadvantage because of a deduction through a fine. So if we could get that sorted, because I'm, I know it's a justice issue, but we'd be effectively agreeing to penalise the whole family unless we get that clarified. Yeah, we can we can seek clarification for that. There is a process actually where obviously the Department of Justice would write to the department obviously in regards to the, the fine. It would obviously be handled by our operational side of the department, uh, and there is a process where obviously they would actually apply to the department actually to to get the fine deducted from the benefit and obviously there is a, would be a process uh, taken forward on that aspect of it. But there is also, I can just add, there is, um, the department does actually have a priority uh, order for in terms of deductions from benefits so we would follow that process um, so that obviously the individual, um, you know, obviously the fine is imposed against, um, there would never be a maximum of 30% of their benefit we would take for various deductions. I, I understand that, but all I'm hearing is process, process. We're not getting to the bottom of the question, which is, as part of that process and the deduction of the fine, I'm not arguing against the deduction, I'm not arguing against the fine. What I'm concerned about is the impact of that fine on the entire family. And we're, that's, not being, that's not being answered. So even, for example, if a fine was imposed in court and the process kicked off, where the, the fine was to be claimed from the person convicted. Is there a mechanism that their whole family circumstances are taken into consideration before that's triggered? Because once a judgment's made, then it's up to the person to prove that they're claiming the benefits for the family. And at that stage, everything just kicks in. So um, that's, that's the implication of not having a direct answer. I can, I'll seek clarification on the operational aspect of it and obviously come back to the committee if that's I, okay. I vaguely remember when we were the old days in, under the SD looking at the welfare reform bill, I vaguely remember that this was an issue that was highlighted, um, where that 
yes, there is a fine, and a fine does have to be paid, but it has to be paid at an amount that is not um, going to put a family in, uh, at risk in any way. Um, so I think more clarification on that yeah, would yeah, be... We'll clarify the process for you. If you don't mind, it's no. just that because no, it falls on us, then justice have kind of passed it and washed their hands. Do you want then to defer that statutory rule until next week? Do we get the information then, or do you want Please. to go ahead? Okay, well, then Please. can we defer that one? Item number 37. Okay, then if we can then move on to rules relating to the social fund, which is agenda items 38 to 40. Um, for clarity, we will take individual briefings on each and then put the question to committee after each briefing on these ones. I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Paul McKenna. Okay, thank you. Okay, morning all. My name is Paul McKenna. I work with John here in SSPLD. I have responsibility for social fund and child maintenance. So today I'm going to talk you through three uh, sets of regulations related to social fund that we've brought through in the past couple of years, all subject to the negative resolution procedure. Okay, so agenda item number 38 is SR 2017 number 55, which is the social fund amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. Um, now, the purpose of these regulations, the, the Welfare Reform and Work Act 2016 introduced reforms to child tax, tax credits legislation, which would have impacted on people who were eligible for a social fund payment. So basically, these regulations made consequential amendments that were necessary to our social fund legislation to basically ensure that any claimant that would have been eligible for a social fund payment prior to the introduction of the changes to the child tax credit legislation wouldn't be disadvantaged, they wouldn't lose out. Basically, it was all about maintaining the status quo. Uh, we also took the opportunity to make amendments to vary weather, yeah, to vary weather station designations, that's quite difficult to say, relevant to cold weather payments, without the need to come here every time a variation was required. So that, that's basically the crux of those. Anybody, any questions on those regulations? What's a varied weather station? <laughs> well, <laughs> basically, we would have, uh, is it, uh, I can't remember, seven main or nine main weather stations. We call them primary designations. Now, they're designated by the Met Office because obviously they have the expertise to work out what uh, weather station is best suited for the climate in whatever area. They're linked to postcodes. So we have these published. So for whatever reason, say a weather station's down um, and we need to change it to another one, so we have a subsequent one, or if Met Office decide, uh, you know, we have another weather station here, it's better, it's more reliable, it's providing better data, we would use that. So instead of us having to come up here and explain to you, basically the Met Office have come to us and they have told us this station's more appropriate, we can now just change it in guidance and publish it online. So it's just about being more efficient, yeah. really. Fair enough. Okay, so that's... This is around the child chair side. Mm, uh, the two child drill? No, no. Nothing no. at all. Are, are you on about the child tax credit yes, stuff? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, to be honest, Mark, I'm not well sure. I can't remember. And child tax credits, as in me, all I did was made sure that my area responsibility, which was social fund, were not impacted. Yeah. And that was the drive behind these consequential amendments. Is that okay? Oh. Cheers, Paul. Cheers, Mark. <laughs> okay, so that is 38 complete then? Yep. Okay, I then will ask members, um, agenda item 38, SR 2017 55, the Social Fund Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to that rule being made? No. Okay, then I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017 55. The Social Fund Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2017 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Okay, then we're going to move on to Agenda Item 39, SR 2018192. Yeah, Alright, so Agenda Item 39, SR 2018192, Social Fund and Income Related Benefits, Miscellaneous Amendments and Savings Regulations Northern Ireland 2018. Um, these regulations uh, were introduced to amend social security legislation here as a consequence of Scotland introducing their early years assistance regulations, basically the best start grants. It kind of touches about what you mentioned earlier. 
the, the amendments basically ensure that only claimants living in Northern Ireland are eligible for a short stop maternity grant, as they are at the moment, and that recipients of an early year's assistance, the best start grant element, who would have got one in Scotland and then moved here, couldn't <coughs> double claim, basically. Um, and they also ensured we that the, if you receive an early year's assistance, best start grant, that they are disregarded in income-related benefits for income and capital purposes in line with the way we treat share start maternity grants. So basically, if you got the equivalent in Scotland and moved here, you'd be treated as if you got the share start maternity grant here, so you wouldn't be disadvantaged. So these regulations may correspond to amendments to those made by DWP, which were set out in their Social Security Scotland Act 2018 Best Start Grants Consequential Modifications Order 2018. Anybody any questions? No. Okay. Then we'll move on. Then agenda item 39, SR 192, the Social Fund and Income Related Benefits Miscellaneous Amendments and Saving Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. Members, any objections to the rule? No. No objections. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-192, the Social Fund and Income Related Benefits, Miscellaneous Amendments and Savings Regulation Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to Agenda Item 40, <coughs> SR 2018-45. Okay. Agenda item 40, SR 20, number 45, the Social Fund Funeral Expenses Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. Um, these regulations introduce changes to your Social Fund Funeral Expenses Payment Scheme. Uh, they mainly enable the Department to clarify some issues around eligibility and make the actual process for claiming funeral expenses payments simpler. Um, now, the key things they did were they allowed claimants to receive additional contributions from charities, friends and relatives, um, without that being deducted from the actual award of FEP that we would give out. They provided for exceptions for people in care homes, so that, you know, I always get mixed up when I'm trying to explain this, but it's not me. So basically, you're in ineligible for an FEP if the, your deceased has a relative not claiming qualifying benefits. So we're making exceptions, for instance, where this other relative is living in a care home that is funded by a trust based on an income assessment. It wasn't about extending eligibility, it was just about allowing exceptions. Uh, on top of that, we also extended the period in which you can make a claim for a funeral expense payment from three to six months. We were finding that three months could be a bit tight, particularly if you were, in, it's okay if you were signposted immediately, but if you weren't, three months was too tight, so we've extended that. Um, another area we improved on was the application form for children's funerals. It used to be like 22 pages long, slightly onerous in those kind of circumstances where you really don't want to be dealing with that. So that was shortened to eight pages. Um, we clarified some exclusive rights of burial, and we allowed for the electronic submission of evidence from undertakers now, just to speed up the process. And, so that was the main things that these regulations did. As I said, it was really around eligibility and making the streamlining the process, making it a bit simpler. Is anybody any questions? Uh, Carol? As it looks as if it's going to make it a lot simpler, particularly for families who are going through that traumatic yeah. experience. The new decade, new approach mm -hmm. has um, commitments around supporting brave families. Will those mean that this needs to be operated or looked at again? Um, as you may be aware, I mean, if, I'm just, it was in November 19, the GB Minister for I think, Welfare Delivery did announce the intention to increase the funeral payment award from the maximum of 700 to 1,000 pounds. Yeah. Um, Obviously, that's something we're looking at, but would still be subject to ministerial approval. Okay. Because um, ministers just in post, we have to yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, anything is going to mean more support for families rather than penalising them in this circumstance? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's not going to impact what we're going to pass today. No, no, no. I mean, these things are in, and as you said, it's about simplifying and making right, the process okay. easier for bereaved families. Um, and any further developments in this, I mean, if there is an increase, we will be coming back 
and engaging with the committee as part of policy development and the draft and the many regulations. So we will be back. Robin? Sure. Uh, can, I, can I just refer you to um, the discretionary payment? And you just indicated that, yes, it is capped at £700. Yes. Pounds. So it's £700 for Northern Ireland at yes. this stage. Yes. But am I right in picking you up that it's a thousand pounds? Not yet. It's not yet. It's still seven hundred uh, across the rest of the UK. Yeah. Okay. But so in the event that it is upgraded in GB, rest of the UK will get mm -hmm. the extra three hundred. How would that then be required to? Will it just automatically come to to Northern Ireland? Then? Oh no, no. I mean, obviously, it would be our intention to maintain party in this area so that the yeah. people are are disadvantaged. But we would have to amend our regulations, and as part of that, we will we would be back here discussing it again. Oh, okay. And and the just explain to me the the item or services under a prepaid funeral plan. In my experience is that people who are requiring uh, funeral um, uh, payments yeah. don't neither, neither, usually have prepaid funeral plans. Yes, that, well, you would assume that, but I mean, if someone does have a funeral plan and they have paid into it, I mean, the intention is not for the department to double pay for something you're already getting. If you've paid into a funeral plan, you know, you will be getting whatever you agreed to sign up at the start. So we're not going to give you uh, money for something which has already been paid for. Uh, but they can get £120? Oh, yeah. There will be things you can get, but it's not going to cover stuff you've already got. I think it's is the intention. Right. OK. I have Mark. Sorry, you finished, Robin? Oh, yeah. I have Mark and then Johnny. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Paul. Just a wee question around eligibility and mm -hmm. To what extent department investigate eligibility? So, if the claim is made, say, by the spouse of the deceased yeah. who is in receipt of uh -huh. a qualifying benefit, how then do the department ascertain that there is another relative who responsibility as to who isn't in receipt of that benefit, who is working, who could afford it? Because I know it's an issue that has arisen, uh -huh. those with some constituency cases I've dealt with, where you have the Maybe because son who is it, has been estranged from the, the, the deceased for ten years, yeah. because he's working. But the, there is conditions to do with estrangement as well. I mean, you can't. You're not, you won't be expected to pay for a funeral if you haven't spoken to someone in twenty years, just because you're a relative. I mean, that is that is covered under eligibility. There is stuff about estrangement and. Oh yeah, they won't be expected to pay, and yeah. they won't be paying. Yeah, it'll be the spouse who's paying, but won't qualify because of. Of the other person that may not be officially yeah. estranged as such, but there's been a break in the relations. Yeah. I would need, to be honest, on the detail that I cannot recall the detail of that. I would need to ask me. Bob Scott, I can go back to you. In terms of investigation, how did the department do that? Do they just look at death notices and papers and track down family members? I am honestly not too sure. I can find out for you. I will find out for you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, and come back to you on that. Um, it's one of the ones I know a bit, but I don't know enough. And if I start talking, I could. I know the female. You know. <laughs> so I'll I'll come back to you on that one with detail from our operational colleagues. That's yeah. okay. Johnny. Thank you. It's it's just a couple of questions, maybe for for some clarity. In relation to the discretionary element, which is capped at seven hundred, how, how long has that been the case, or has that fluctuated over a period of time? Oh, um, sorry. Uh, I have here somewhere. It, it hasn't fluctuated. It's been that same amount for, yes, quite a while. Uh, I do have it written here on... Oh, I do have lines to take saying this, but I can't find them.
be no, can't come back to us on this. Uh, it's not, no, it's it's not, not essential it's, it's for not the right, question, no. but can get back to us on that. You, you yeah. can okay. come back on that one. The, the other point was just <clears throat> in relation to the extension to six months, which I think we all would welcome. Um, is that now in line with the rest of, of GB in relation yes. to yes. So it's, not, it's yeah. six months right across yeah. the board? These have been in now for, I think, two years. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just finally, and again, you may have to just come, come back on this point, but I noticed in terms of the funeral expenses payment, uh, it mentions the cost of necessary documentation and in some cases, transport of the deceased body. I've dealt with cases uh, at the moment, Chair, where um, relatives have been unable to um, have ashes returned of family members uh, if it's in the rest of GB due to transportation issues. Uh -huh. um, a lot of transportation organisations will not uh, carry... Uh, remains or ashes? Is there? Does it include ashes? Uh, I, I don't see. I just see it mentions a deceased body, but will that also cover the return of ashes? If you don't have it with you, I could. I, I believe it does, but I will clarify mm. that and come back okay. to you. Thank you. Okay. Just I have Sinead first, so I'm bringing Sinead in. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's just a question around uh, 3.4. Um, the second part of it there where it says currently a claim for a funeral expense payment can be refused because the deceased has an immediate relative other than the applicant who is not receiving a qualifying benefit and to whom responsibility would be assigned despite the fact that they are in a car home funded by their local health and social care trust and unlikely to be able to pay for the funeral. That seems very harsh and regressive. Sorry, where are we reading here? So it's on, um, so it's uh, 3.4, second half of Oh, and that's what would change, almost not. Yes. Is that, so that's what it is currently, will, will the amendments? Those, um, that's, what I, uh, that's what I was trying to explain, I maybe didn't do it too well, but it was exempting people living in a care home, the insurer, that they weren't deemed someone that could pay for it. Right, okay. Does that make sense? Yes. That's what I meant to say the first time. So it's positive rather than negative? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, that was, yeah. Apologies. Okay, Mark, you want, sorry, Sinead, are you finished? That's it, yeah. Okay, well, Mark, you want to come back? Your, your list, maybe. <laughs> well, and that's uh, in instances where there are no immediate relatives, and there might be someone who had been died in a shelter of some description uh -huh. who can make an application on their behalf, or if, if they pass away, who can make an application. I believe it may be council, but I will double. Does that not fall under different rules if there isn't someone, if there isn't an next yeah, or someone? It's, it's, it's not completely F &B different. One, this. Yeah. It's under the general social fund yeah. regulations. But I, I, if I call, because I remember being at a, last year at a workshop and somebody asked that, and I think there is actually a, a friend can apply if there is no immediate family. A friend actually can apply. But it has to be a friend. Yeah, I'm nearly said we're going to clarify. What do you say? It could be nobody, say, like an employee of the the home or shelter mm -hmm. or wherever, because they aren't in receipt of the benefit. Oh yeah, you know, no. It creates. An, I would, you, what you're saying is, if if the person has nobody. Yeah. Yeah, I think then it, it is council, but we will come back. That is, I I, I've had that before in my previous life in social services, where you would have had um, the, people that didn't have anyone. It, it's one. not this yeah. regulation, I know that much. So, OK, happy enough to get feedback on those various issues that you all brought up over funerals. I'm always delighted. I am delighted. Always delighted. Yeah. Always delighted. <laughs> Our members then um, content that we move forward on item agenda number 40, um, SR 2018-45. Just yeah. that we move on with it? Okay. Then um, I'll proceed then to ask members if they any objection to SR 2018-45, the Social Fund Funeral Expenses Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018. No objections? No. Okay. I'm going to read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-45, the Social Fund Funeral Expenses Expenses <coughs> Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that. You. Okay, members, we're going to move on to statutory rules relating to pension credit, miscellaneous amendments and income-related benefit disregards. And can I welcome Una McConnell and Rosemary Hughes to the table?
Okay, members, we're going to consider the statutory rule relating to pension credit agenda item 41. And you're very welcome, Una and Rosemary. So if you'd like to begin on agenda item 41. Yeah, thank you. So um, agenda item, 40, item number 41, SR 2018-135, state pension credit additional amount for child or qualifying young person amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. Um, it was necessary to bring in the regulations to amend the State Pension Credit Regulations Northern Ireland 2003 to ensure that after the abolition of the child tax credit for all new claimants, upon the completion of the Universal Credit Rollout from February 2019, support for children continues to be provided for low-income pensioners by the introduction of a new additional amount within pension credit. Um, any questions on that? Is that us on that one? Yes. yes that's okay. okay. Any questions on that, members? No? Okay, well then, uh, we'll then um, ask if there are any objections to the rule under SR 2018-135, the State Pension Credit Additional Amount, am I reading the right one? Yes. I am. Additional Amount for Child or Qualifying Young Person Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. All agreed? Yeah. Okay, we can move on and put the uh, uh, read it in that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-135 the State Pension Credit Additional Amount for Child or Qualifying Young Person Amendment Regulation, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda, agenda item number 46, SR 2017-42. Okay, you. this is... Um, uh, Miss Mem, our agenda item number 46, SR 2017 242, the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendments number 3, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. Um, this statutory rule makes a number of positive amendments or tidies up regulations. Um, it makes amendments to Social Security benefits to future proof regulations by removing the age of 65 or replacing with pensionable age. Uh, it also makes an amendment to the Income Support General Regulations Northern Ireland 1987 to ensure that a small number of people with severe conditions who have been entitled to income support since December 2009 do not lose their entitlement in consequence of the exercise to move people from disability living allowance to personal independence payment. Um, an amendment is also made to the State Pension Credit Regulations Northern Ireland 2003 so that the rules on eligibility for the saving credit for people in polygamous marriages are aligned with the eligibility for saving credits for couples. And finally, the statutory rule makes amendments to the housing benefits for persons who have attained the qualifying age for State Pension Credit Regulations Northern Ireland 2006 to correct an error in the drafting of a provision which provides an increased earning disregard for allowable child care charges and to add a requirement, the claimant report an absence of four weeks or more outside Northern Ireland to the department. Any, que that's it. Any, Any questions on that, members? And apologies, Anna, for confusing you right at the very beginning of that. Right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to confuse anybody more than I'm confused. Um, members, then, will uh, agenda item 46 SR 2017-242, Social Security Miscellaneous Amendments Number 3, Regulations Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to this rule? No? Okay. Then I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-242, the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendments Number 3, Regulations Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objections to the rule. Okay, then we'll move on to the set of regulation, regulations dealing with income-related benefits regards. Is that okay? So we move to agenda items number 42, uh, SR 27205. Okay, um, well, the next set of regulations are really relating to um, disregard, so they're positive um, amendments. Uh, so agenda item number 42, SR 2017-2005, the Social Security Emergency Funds Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. The amendments ensure payments made by the Wheel of Manchester Emergency Fund and London Emergencies Trust are fully disregarded for the purposes of calculating entitlement to income-related benefits and funeral expense payments for anyone already in receipt of those benefits or those who may become new claimants. Okay. Any questions, members, on Agenda Item 42? No? Okay. Then Agenda Item 42, SR 2017-205, the Social Security Emergency Funds Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to the rule? 
No. I'll read that the Committee, Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-205, the Social Security Emergency Funds Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, then we're going to move on to Agenda Items 43, um, SR 2017-62, Agenda Item 44, SR 2019-23, both relate to income-related benefits. Um, are you going to give one briefing to cover both of those? Or? For 43 and 44. Um, are we going to do them separately? Whatever? I can do them together. Um, so the first one, agenda item number 43, SR 2017-62, the Social Security Income Related Benefits Amendments Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017 are beneficial in that the statutory rule amends the disregard of income other than earnings in those income-related benefit regulations where that income is a payment made by a government to victims of nationalist, national socialist persecution so that the same disregard applies in all cases. Then agenda item number 44, SR 2019-33, the Social Security Income-Related Benefits Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019 amend a number of income-related Social Security benefits to apply a disregard in respect for CARES Alliance supplement paid to a claimant by the Scottish Government. Um, although this measure is likely to have a direct impact in Northern Ireland, a case may arise where a claimant moves from Scotland to Northern Ireland and receives a retrospective payment of CARES Alliance supplement, and this statutory rule ensures that this payment will be disregarded from income-related Social Security benefits in Northern Ireland. Okay, members, any questions on 43 or 44? No. Okay. So, agenda item 43, SR 2017-62, the Social Security Income Related Benefits Amendment Regulation, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to the rule? No. Okay, I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017 one, start again, that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-62, the Social Security Income Related Benefits Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objections to the rule. Agenda item 44, SR 2019-23, the Social Security Income Related Benefits Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to this rule? No, nope. I read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-23, the Social Security Income Related Benefits Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, then we'll now move on to agenda item 45, SR 2017-219. Okay, um, 2017-219, the Social Security Infected Blood and Thalidomide Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2017. This is another beneficial statutory rule that amends a number of income-related Social Security benefits to provide for an income and capital disregard in respect of payments made by the new Scottish Infected Blood Support Scheme, the Infected Blood Payment Scheme for Northern Ireland, the Thalidomide Scheme and any other scheme which is approved by the Secretary of State. It also um, exempts payments from the Department's Compensation Recovery Scheme. I think Johnny, you want to ask? Yeah, no, it's just to, to check uh, in line with the new decade, new approach commitments in relation to contaminated blood and also the announcement from the Minister. Uh, will there be a need for this to be updated again? Um, well, it does say other schemes which are approved by the Secretary of State, um, but I'm not sure. The fact is that it was been. We're not aware yet. We don't know yet. Okay. So if it does, then you'll be back to us. Well, I would imagine yeah. similar schemes would be treated in the same way. Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So agenda item forty-five two one seven two. Yeah. Agenda item forty-five two thousand and seventeen two one nine. The Social Security Infected Blood and Thalidomide Regulations, Northern Ireland, twenty seventeen. Any objections to the rule? Okay. So I read that the <coughs> committee for communities has considered. 2017-219, the Social Security Infected Blood and Thalidomide Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rules. Then we'll move on, members, to item uh, to agenda item 47, SR 2018-149. Over to you again. Okay. SR 2018-149, the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2018. These regulations amend a number of Social Security related statutory rules to include reference to the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014. 
Uh, the regulations also amend the Housing Benefit Regulations Northern Ireland 2006, clarify the qualifying conditions for a disregard when a claimant is a member of a couple. This change restores the regulation to reflect the policy attempt, intent that the person working is also the one who meets the qualifying conditions by being the one who is entitled to a disability premium or is receiving the support component of their Employment and Support Alliance Award or in the Work-Related Activity Group. Members, any questions on item agenda 47? No. Nope. Okay. Agenda item 47, SR 2018-149, the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendment Regulation, Northern Ireland 2018. Um, any, uh, members, any objections to the rule? No. Nope. So I'll read as follows. That the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-149, the Social Security Miscellaneous Amendments Regulation, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rules. Okay, lastly then, in this section, we have agenda item 48, SR 2018-150. Go ahead. Okay, um, SR 2018-150, the Social Security Treatment of Arrears of Benefit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. These regulations expand the existing capital disregards and income-related Social Security benefits to apply equally where arrears of £5,000 are paid as a result of an error on a point of law. This means that the arrears in question could be disregarded for the life of the benefit rather than the current maximum of 52 weeks. Okay, any questions, members, on agenda item 48? Carol? So this means, say, for example, um, or does this mean, at, irrespective of what benefit someone's on, if they've been awarded, say, for example, getting back paid, PIPs, that if they're on something else, it's not going to be, they're not going to be penalised for it? If, if, if the back payment has, has arisen as a result of an error of law, then it won't have an impact on their other income-related benefits. Yeah. It'll be disregarded. It's usually it's error purposes. rather than fraud. That, that ha that's always an error within the system. Yeah, if it's an error of law, if the law has been applied incorrectly, then... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we'll don't give it to you in one hand and take it off you in another. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Okay, any more questions on yes, that, sure. Robin? doesn't have an impact on benefits. Does it have any impact outside of benefits in terms of um, uh, you know, um, income tax or something of that nature if someone is receiving a... a, a um, income a, tax rules we wouldn't really no. um, be able to comment on. Um, we're only dealing specifically with the income-related benefits here and the impact it would have there. Probably not likely, but um, if it was a substantial... Backlog or back payment of money. Sorry. I don't know if it's taxable or not, but um, the main payment. point is it doesn't you know, impact on your benefits. Yeah, I've never come yeah. across it because I know we've all as yeah. constituency MLAs yeah. um, recovered yeah, substantial amounts for people. You know, I had one just in November, right. which was 28,000 yeah. duty an hour by the department, um, and there wasn't any issues around no, it's not tax on that. So Sorry. Mm. Um, uh, Mark, did you want just to comment? One point is just for me about the clarification on the difference between an official error and an error on the point of law. Um, well, you know this is addressing the difference or, yes. or the difference well, in the way they're treated. But an official error may be whenever um, the department has made a mistake and maybe administrating the benefits. But an official error on the point of law was. I think this came about following a legal challenge the department had with ESSA and PIP, and people were put onto the wrong, were put onto contribution ESSA rather than income yeah. ESSA. So it's a misinterpretation of the law, or rather than official errors, maybe when you know an official has made a mistake, you know, and advised the claimant of but something. I would argue that the official has made the mistake. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, it's, it's, this addresses the difference. Where the law has been applied incorrectly, as opposed to when you know an officer of the department. Has maybe just done done, done something yeah, wrong. But someone has applied the law incorrectly, I would argue. But, but it's just probably down to interpretation. You know, I mean, the, the case, the, the situation that Una was talking about was where people were being, um, when they introduced Employment and Support Alliance in place of incapacity benefit, and people were being reassessed, and they they were moved over maybe to the wrong element of Employment and Support Alliance, so there was an obvious error of law there. Um, and as she said, you know, the courts in that recognised that, so 
um, a lot of people were receiving backdated arrears. So it would have been grossly unfair for them to be penalised um, because of a mistake that was made in the interpretation of the law. Um, so that was the reason for the introduction of oh, this. No, 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 yeah. no. Okay, members, then we'll move then uh, agenda item 48, SR 2018-150, the Social Security Treatment of Arrears of Benefit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. Any objections to this rule? No. Nope. Okay. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-150, Social Security Treatment of Arrears of Benefit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, at this stage, I am going to break for a 10-minute comfort break before we start the pension regulations. Are members in agreement? Great. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, can I declare the meeting open again to the public? Um, we're about to move to the statutory rules dealing with pensions. First of those uh, that relate to the pensions protection funds, which encompass agenda items 49 to 54. Can I welcome Jerry McCann, Doreen Roy, and Michelle Grills? And Michelle, you're going to join us later, sorry. So just uh, Jerry and Doreen back again with us. Right, I'm sure you're looking forward to this. <laughs> Couldn't wait, can't we? Yep. <laughs> after last week, it's so exciting. Okay, then, uh, Jerry and Doreen, if you would like to begin, and as mentioned earlier, where you have one briefing that encompasses more than one statutory rule, I'd appreciate clarity on that so I can read appropriate SRs into the record. So, can we begin then with agenda item 49? Doreen's going to read. Um, as last week, these statutory rules are strict clarity measures necessary to maintain what is in effect a single pension system across the UK. Um, by way of background first, um, in relation to the Pension Protection Fund and these negative resolution uh, uh, rules, the Pension Prote Protection Fund, which operates UK-wide, provides compensation for members of defined benefit occupational pension schemes, where the sponsoring employer is insolvent and the scheme has insufficient assets to pay benefits at the fund compensation levels. 
The Pension Protection Fund is funded via a combination of transferred scheme funds, recoveries from insolvent employers, investment returns and a levy on eligible schemes. PPF compensation is paid to those who are over the scheme's normal pension age or who are in receipt of an ill health or survivor's pension at the date of the insolvency event at 100% of the pension in payment or due at that date. The compensation payable to anyone who is under their scheme's normal pensionable age at the date of the insolvency, excluding those who have retired in health grounds, is based on 90% of their accrued pension. This amount is subject to an overall maximum, the compensation cap. Turning to agenda item 49, SR 2018, number 26, the Pension Protection Fund Compensation Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2015. These regulations are designed to correct an anomaly whereby certain members in receipt of or with an automatic right to a bridging pension, that is, a pension which allows members of such schemes who retire before reaching state pension age to be paid a higher rate of pension until they reach state pension age or the appropriate date as defined in the pension scheme rules. So members of such schemes who... Um, Sorry, um, members in receipt of or with an automatic right to a bridging pension would continue to receive compensation based on the high rate for life. For some members, this means that they may be financially better off in the Pension Protection Fund than they would have been under the rules of their scheme in that the amount of compensation they receive may exceed the amount of pension they would have received had their scheme not entered the PPF. It was not the intention that members of schemes entering the PPF should benefit for life from what was intended to be a temporary increase and the regulations address this anomaly. The regulations amend existing regulations so the PPF compensation for members with a bridging pension reduces in a similar way as it would have done under the rules of the original scheme. Modify the way that the compensation cap is applied to members with bridging pensions. Make provision regarding early and late payment of compensation for members in receipt of bridging pensions. Make provision regarding entitlement to survivors' compensation in respect of a bridging pension where the member dies before the decrease date. The changes mean that the amount of compensation received by these members will, in this respect, more closely reflect the benefits that they would have received had their scheme not entered the PPF. Okay, any questions on agenda item 49? No. Do you want to move on, or do you want us to take them separately? Um, whatever it's it's up to you. you. Whatever. Just, I think we we'll just move on, and we'll yeah. read them all at the end. Then okay. moving on to number fifty. Okay, agenda item fifty. SR two thousand seventeen number fifty nine. The Pension Protection Fund Modification Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland two thousand seventeen. The Pensions Act, Northern Ireland two thousand and fifteen provides for the cap applied to PPF compensation to be increased to recognise long service, known as the long service cap. From the 6th of April 2017, the long service cap increased the standard cap by 3% for every complete year of pensionable service above 20 years, up to a new maximum of twice the standard cap. The new cap will reflect the fact that people who have worked for a long time for one employer are reliant on that employer's pension scheme for a large proportion of their retirement income. The regulations also allow for any compensation arising from different sources, for example from a person's own pensionable service and from a pension credit arising from a divorce settlement, to have two separate caps applied. They ensure that a person's pensionable service is treated cumulatively so that those with tranches of compensation payable from the same source at different dates can benefit from the long service cap. 
These proposed amendments are retrospective, triggers having effect from the 6th of April 2005, the date the original PPF compensation regulations came into effect, and ensure that the long service cap operates in line with the policy intent where a member has compensation from more than one source or from one source, but entitlement arises at different dates. In addition, the regulations allow the PPF to discharge as a lump sum an individual's money purchase benefits, where the total value of those benefits is below £10,000, in line with the revised tax maximum. Any questions on no. item 50? No, moving on then, 51. Uh, agenda item 51, SR 2018, number 165. The Pensions Protection Fund, Pensionable Service and Occupational Pension Schemes, Investment and Disclosure, Amendment and Modification, Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2018. A High Court Judgment, Beaton versus the, the Board of the PPF, resulted in the PPF legislation being interpreted in a way that did not reflect PPF practice or the policy intent in cases where a person has benefits derived from a relevant fixed pension. Broadly, a relevant fixed pension is a pension transfer in the form of a lump sum determined at the time the transfer payment is received and which is not attributable to a pension credit or payable as a result of a person's death. The judgment found that a relevant fixed pension arising from a transfer payment was not attributable pensionable service under the relevant scheme and therefore could not be aggregated with the member's main pension for the purposes of the compensation cap. The judgment also has wider negative implications which would result in some individuals seeing their PPF compensation payments reduced or stopped altogether. This would include some vulnerable groups such as widows, widowers and eligible dependent children in receipt of survivor benefits derived wholly or in part from a relevant fixed pension. To ensure that the PPF have the legal basis to administer the compensation regime as intended, the regulations clarify that a relevant fixed pension is regarded as a tributable pensionable service for the purpose of calculating PPF compensation. The regulations also amend the Occupational Pension Schemes Investment Regulations Northern Ireland 2005 and the Occupational and Personal Pension Schemes Disclosure Information Regulations Northern Ireland 2014 to provide for trustees to include a policy on how they will take account of financially material considerations. This includes, but is not limited to, environmental, social and governance considerations, including climate change, in relation to investments in the statement of investment principles and the default SIP. They require trustees of schemes, except schemes with fewer than 100 members, to include a policy on when they will undertake engagement activities in relation to investments including monitoring and engaging with relevant persons, such as an investment manager in the SIP and the de default SIP. They require the trustees of a relevant scheme to include in the annual report a statement on the extent to which the SIP has been followed during the scheme year and an explanation of any changes made to the statement during that year, the implementation statement. It obliges trustees to make available free of charge the SIP and the implementation statement on a website or where appropriate in hard copy form to the public as a whole to enable people to compare costs and charges of different occupational pension schemes. In addition, the trustees must include details about the availability of these publications in the annual benefit statement issued to members with money purchase benefits. Thank you. Any questions in relation to 51? Okay, move on then to 52, Doreen. Agenda items 52 to 54, SR 2017, number 39, SR 2018, number 38, and SR 2019, number 22. 
These are the Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Schemes Levy Ceiling <coughs> Compensation Cap Orders. If the Committee agree, we we'll speak to the Committee and the Lawyers. Yep. As I mentioned earlier, Pension Protection Fund compensation is funded through annual pension protection levies imposed by the Fund and charged to all qualifying defined benefit occupational pension schemes. The levy ceiling is a control mechanism which ensures the amount raised through the pension protection levies by the Fund does not exceed a prescribed maximum. The compensation cap is one of a number of measures which help to control the Fund expenditure to enable it to remain sustainable and solvent. The amounts of the levy ceiling and the compensation cap are normally increased in April of each year in line with the general level of earnings since the end of the period of their last review. Whenever the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions makes a levy ceiling and compensation cap order under the Pensions Act 2004, the Department is empowered to make a corresponding order. The Department has no power to set different amounts for Northern Ireland. These are annual orders which set the levy ceiling and compensation caps for the financial year beginning on the 1st of April. The first two orders have now been revoked and replaced by the current order SR 2019 number 22. The current amounts are for the levy ceiling one billion fifty eight billion one hundred and seventy six thousand six hundred and seventeen pounds. And the compensation cap is forty thousand twenty pounds and thirty four pence. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, members, on fifty two to fifty four? No. Okay, so that's that section finished then. We can start then bear with us. We read through this. Um so we'll move then item a Agenda item sorry 49 SR 2018-26, the Pension Protection Fund Compensation Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. <coughs> Any objections to the rule? No. Okay, we'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-26, the Pension Protection Fund Compensation Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Move on then to item agenda number 50, and that is SR 2017-59, the Pension Protection Fund Modification Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to this rule? No. Okay, we'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-59, the Pension Protection Fund Modification Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2017 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objection to the report. <coughs> Agenda item 51, SR 2018-165, the Pension Protection Fund Pensionable Service and Occupational Pension Schemes Investment and Disclosure Amendment and Modification Regulations Northern Ireland 2018. Any members have any objections to this rule? No. We read that the Committee for Communities has considered <coughs> SR 2018-165, the Pension Protection Fund, Pensionable Service and Occupational Pension Schemes, Investment and Disclosure, Amendment and Modification, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, we move on to item agenda item 52, SR 2017-39, the Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Schemes Levy Ceiling and Compensation Cap Order, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to this rule? No. no. Okay, we'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-39, the Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Schemes, Levy Ceiling and Compensation Cap Order, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Then move on then to item, Agenda Item 53, SR 2018-38. The Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Schemes, Levy Ceiling and Compensation Cap Order, Northern Ireland 2018. Any objections to this rule? No. no. 
Kyle then will read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-38, the Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Schemes, Levy Sailing and Compensation Cap Order, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Then on to agenda, agenda item 54, SR 2019-22, the Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Schemes, Levy, Sailing and Compensation Cap Order, Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to this rule? No. Okay, no objections. So we'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-22, the Pension Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Schemes, Levy, Sailing and Compensation Cap Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objections to this rule. Okay, we're now going to move on to agenda item 55, SR 2018-40. Sorry. Um, this is uh, appropriate in independent advice, negative resolution uh, regulation. Uh, agenda item 55. SR 2018 number 40, Pension Schemes Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice, Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. These regulations amend the Pension Schemes Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2015, the Appropriate Advice Regulations. To provide for a new requirement for schemes to send members with safeguarded flexible benefits information about the guarantees those benefits offer before they proceed to transfer, convert or flexibly access them. Safeguarded benefits are benefits which offer members an element of guarantee in relation to their retirement savings. They offer a level of security in retirement savings which a member would lose if they were to exchange them for benefits which could be accessed flexibly. That's, um, that's okay. it. Do you want me to move on to the other set? or? Um, you want to take that one? No, we'll take that one separately. Um, uh, any questions, members, on item 55? Nope. No? Okay. So we'll go on then with agenda item 55, SR 2018-40, the Pension Schemes Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018. Um, any objections to the rule? No. no. No objections. We'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-40, the Pension Schemes Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objections to the rule. Now move on then to Agenda Item 57, SR 2019-184, which is subject to confirmatory procedure. Agenda item 57, SR 2019, number 184, the Pension Schemes Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice, Amendment number 2, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. These regulations form part of a package of amendments to the Appropriate Advice Regulations alongside the Pension Schemes Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice, Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2018, <coughs> SR 2018, number 40. They provide a simpler process for trustees and scheme managers to value members' pension savings, classified as safeguarded benefits, when determining whether the requirement to take independent financial advice applies. These regulations are subject to the confirmatory procedure. In the absence of the Assembly to ensure continuity of provision, SR 2019-184 is the latest in a series of regulations uh, to revoke and replace the first set of regulations which were made in 2018. SR 2018 number 46. Obviously, in normal circumstances, the Department would not have sought to remake confirmatory regulations on a rolling basis. The current regulations, SR 2019 number 184, 
will cease to have effect if not approved by the Assembly before the 27th of March 2020. Okay, thank you. Any questions, members? No. no. Okay, agenda item 57, SR 2019-184, the Pension Scheme Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice Amendment Number 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to the rule? No. Okay, I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-184, the Pension Schemes Act 2015, Transitional Provisions and Appropriate Independent Advice, Amendment No. 2, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Okay, we now move on then to Agenda Item 60, SR 2017-66. Agenda Item 60, SR 2017-66, no. the Pensions 2015 Act, Supplementary and Incidental Amendments Order, Northern Ireland 2017. This order makes consequential, supplementary and incidental amendments in relation to provisions of Part 5 of the Pensions Act, Northern Ireland 2015, which created a new bereavement support payment for persons whose spouse or civil partner dies on or after the 6th of April 2017. Bereavement support payment replaces the existing Social Security benefits for the bereaved. Bereavement Alliance, Widow Parents Alliance and Bereavement Payment. These amendments ensure that existing secondary legislation makes reference to bereavement support payment where appropriate and provides for the interaction with other Social Security benefits as a consequence of the introduction of this new benefit. Those who were already in receipt of or entitled to existing bereavement benefits continue to receive their current benefit for the lifetime of their award. Okay, thank you. Any questions on item 60? No. no. Okay, agenda item 60, SR 2017-66, the Pensions 2015 Act, Consequential, Supplementary and Incidental Amendments Order, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to the rule? No. Okay, I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-66, the Pensions 2015 Act, Consequential, Supplementary and Incidental Amendments Order, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objections to the rule. Now I move on to four statutory rules relating to state pension. They include agenda items 61 to 63, and another rule dealing with the same issue has been tabled. Um, we do this all in one briefing, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, these are the state pension debits and credits revaluation orders, which are annual orders. <coughs> Pensions Act, Northern Ireland, 2015, introduced a new state pension for people reaching pensionable age on or after the 5th of April 2016. The new state pension recognises national insurance contributions which were paid or credited for years prior to the 6th of April 2016. To ensure no one entitled to the new state pension received less than they would have received under the old scheme, in these cases the 2015 Act provides for an individual's state pension to be paid at a transitional rate which may include a protected payment. These annual orders increase the protected payment from the start of the review period on the 6th of April 2016. Where divorce proceedings begin on or after the 6th of April 2016, courts can order the sharing of a protected payment as part of a divorce settlement. When such a pension sharing order is made, a debit is recorded on the national insurance account of the transferor and a corresponding credit is recorded on the transferee's account. If the relevant party is under state pension age at that time, the debit or credit is revalued in line with increases in prices in the interval before they reach pensionable age when the debit or credit will be activated. The Secretary of State for Work and Pensions is under a statutory duty to review the general level of prices in each tax year. If they have increased, the Secretary of State is required to make an order specifying the percentage of their amount by which the relevant debits and credits are to be increased in order to make up any fall in their value during the review. 
Where the Secretary of State makes such an order, the Department is empowered to make the corresponding revaluing order for Northern Ireland. There is no power for the Department to set an alternative rate for Northern Ireland. The 2020 order in increases will apply <coughs> to debits and credits applicable to people reaching pensionable age on or after the 7th of April 2020. Okay. That us for that group? Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Members, any questions on 6162-63 or tabled item 79? No? Okay. So, agenda item 61, SR 2017-227, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation Number 2 Order, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objection to this rule? No. 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 <coughs> I read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-227, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation No. 2 Order, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Agenda Item 62, SR 2017-61, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to the rule? No. no. No objections. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-61, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Agenda Item 63, SR 2018-208, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2018. Any objections to this rule? No. There have been no objections. I read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-208, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation Order Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Moving on then to SR 2026, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation Order Northern Ireland 2020. Any objections to this rule? No. Okay, no objections. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2026, the State Pension Debits and Credits Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. We now move on then to agenda items 64 and 65 and the tabled statutory rule, all of which deal with State Pension Revaluation. Um, also, can we do this in one briefing? Thank you. These are the state pension evaluation for transition and pensions orders, which are annual orders. The orders revalue protected payments to reflect increases in the general level of prices since the 6th of April 2016. Secretary of State for Work and Pensions is under a statutory duty to review the general level of prices annually and where they have increased to make an order specifying the percentage increase by which the protected payment should be revalued. Re where the Secretary of State makes such an order, the Department is empowered to make a corresponding order for Northern Ireland. There is no power for the Department to set an alternative rate for Northern Ireland. Once they are in payment, protected payments are increased in line with prices through annual uprating. In the interval between the 6th of April 2016 and when a person reaches pension <coughs> age, the protected payment is also price protected by way of revaluation. When a person claims their state pension, the 2016 amount of their protected payment will be increased by the percentage set out in the last such order come into operation before they reach pensionable age. The policy intention is that revaluation should result in the same increase as the cumulative uprating of pensions and payment, so that two individuals with the same protected payment at April 2016 should receive the same amount of state pension irrespective of when they reach pensionable age. The 2020 order increases the protected payment by 8.2% from the start of the review period on the 6th of April 2016 and ensures that the revaluation of protected payments will apply to persons reaching pensionable age on or after the 7th of April 2020. Okay, thank you. Members, any questions on 64, 65 or tabled item 80? No. No. 
Okay then, we'll move then to agenda item 64, SR 2017-228, the state pension revaluation for, for transitional pension order Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to the rule? No. Okay, then we'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-228, the state pension revaluation for transitional pensions order Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Moving on then to agenda item 65, SR 2018-207, the state pension revaluation for transitional pensions order Northern Ireland 2018. Any objection to the rule? No objection. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-207, the state pension revaluation for transitional pensions order Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Then on to SR 2027, uh, which was tabled item 80, um, the state pensions re-evaluation for transitional pensions order Northern Ireland 2020. Um, any objections to this rule? No. no, no. Okay. Then we'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2027, the state pensions revaluation for transitional pensions order Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Thank you. We now move on to agenda item 68, which is a statutory rule relating to judicial pensions, which is subject to confirmatory procedure. Doreen. Agenda item 68, SR 2019, <coughs> number 158. The Pension Schemes Act 2015, judicial pensions, consequential provision number two, regulation, Northern Ireland 2019. Historically, unlike salaried judges, fee paid judicial office holders did not earn entitlement to an occupational pension. In the court judgment, in what is commonly referred to as the O'Brien case, this was held to be contrary to the Part Time Work Directive. Following the judgment, the Department <coughs> of Justice introduced a pension scheme for future service from the 1st of April 2015. To comply with the judgment, the Lord Chancellor proposed to make provision for GB and NI for a remedy final salary pension scheme for fee paid judicial office holders for service between April 2000 and the 31st of March 2015. <coughs> to allow this to happen, a minor technical consequential amendment was necessary to the Public Service Pensions Act, Northern Ireland 2014. The legislative provision empowering the Lord Chancellor to make a fee paid pension scheme was introduced by the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2015 and the power to make the requisite consequential amendment to the 2014 Act best in the Department for Communities. If the regulations had not been made, <coughs> the Ministry of Justice had signalled that Northern Ireland could not be included in the UK wide scheme. This would have left departments here in breach of EU law. In February 2017, Pension Schemes Act 2015, Judicial Pensions Consequential Provision <coughs> Regulations Northern Ireland <coughs> 2017 were made. The regulations were subject to the confirmatory procedure. As it was not possible <coughs> for the regulations to be approved in the absence of the Assembly, the regulations have been revoked and replaced on a number of occasions before they cease to have effect. Obviously, in normal circumstances, the Department would not have sought to remake confirmatory regulations on a rolling basis. These current replacement regulations are also subject to the confirmatory procedure, which means they will cease to have effect if they are not approved by the Assembly by the 12th of February 2020. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Any questions, Member, on Agenda Item 68? No. no? Okay. So, SR 2019-158, the Pension Schemes Act 2015, Judicial Pensions Consequential Provision No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to this rule? No. 
Okay, no objections, so we'll read that the Committee for Communities <coughs> has considered SR 2019-158, the Pension Scheme Act 2015, Judicial Pensions, Consequential Provision No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Okay, members, we're now going to move on to Agenda Items 72, 73 and 74. Uh, which are st statutory rules which deal with earning factors, and we'll take those in one briefing as well. These are the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors Orders, which are annual orders. Earnings factors derived from the earnings on which national insurance contributions are paid or treated as paid and are used to determine entitlement to all contributory benefits. In particular, earnings factors are used to calculate entitlement to additional state pension, which includes both the state earnings related to pension scheme and the state second pension under the old state pension system and corresponding guaranteed minimum pensions accrued in respect of pre-1997 membership of formerly contracted out <coughs> salary related pension schemes. The Secretary of State for Work and Pensions is under a statutory duty to review changes in the level of earnings annually and, if appropriate, make an order to increase the earnings factors for past years to reflect these changes, ensuring they maintain their value relative to earnings growth. Whenever the Secretary of State makes such an order, the Department may make a corresponding order for Northern Ireland. The Department has no power to set different percentages. The orders provide that the earnings factors relevant to the calculation of the additional pension and the corresponding guaranteed minimum pensions of formerly contracted out occupational pension schemes are to be increased for the tax years since 1978-79 by a specified percentage. This ensures that they maintain their value in relation to the general level of earnings. The 2019 order provides that the percentage increase for the tax year 2018 to 2019 is 2.8%. The order also provides that the earnings factors for earlier tax years are revalued at 2018-2019 earnings levels to ensure that they maintain their value. Thank you. Members, any questions on 72, 73, 74? No. Okay. So, agenda item 72, SR 2017-53, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors Order Northern Ireland 2017. Any objections to the rule? No. Okay, no objections. So, I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2017-53, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors Order Northern Ireland 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objections to the rule. Item Agenda 73, SR 2018-39, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors Order Northern Ireland 2018. Any objections to this rule? No objections. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2018-39, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors Order Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Then on to item agenda, or agenda item 74, SR 2019-43, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factor Order Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to this rule? No. Okay, I'll read that the committee, the committee for Communities has considered SR 2019-43, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factors Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, the next two statutory rules deal with, deal with EU exit, and we're now joined by Michelle Grills. Uh, Michelle, you are very welcome. Thank you. Um, do you want to uh, brief these separately or together? Um, I'll do these separately. Do it separately, that's fine. Okay, thank you. So, item agenda 75, SR 2019 213. Mm -hmm. 
Agenda item 75, SR 2019, number 213, Social Security Amendment, EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. Under existing legislation, persons who are subject to immigration control are generally not entitled to benefits. However, there are some exceptions to this general approach. Currently, in accordance with the Social Security Immigration and Asylum Consequential Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2000, a person who is lawfully working in Northern Ireland and is a national of a state which has concluded, concluded an association agreement with the EU providing in the field of Social Security for the equal treatment of workers and their families is treated as not being subject to immigration control, meaning they can access certain benefits where all eligibility criteria are met. When the UK leaves the EU, the provisions in the association agreements concluded with third countries under Article 217 of the Treaty of the, on the Functioning of the European Union will be transitioned into trade and partnership agreements. These regulations make simple technical changes to the Social Security, Immigration and Asylum Consequential Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2000 to include references to trade and partnership agreements. This will maintain continuity of access to certain disability and carer benefits and social security payments for those in the scope of these, of these agreements, including Zambrano carers, i.e. non-EEA nationals who are primary carers of a British citizen and derive their right to reside in the UK through the person they care for. The relevant benefits are attendance allowance, personal independence payment, disability living allowance, severe disablement allowance, carers allowance, and social fund payments. The only social fund payment to which the provisions apply is winter fuel payments. Okay, members, any questions on 75? Okay. Mark, did you? Thank you just to see if people are paying attention. Is That's it? two one, 23 instead of two one three. Is yeah. it two one three or two three? Thank God. 213. 213. 213. 113. Yeah. We noticed that. <laughs> Page 1175 and 1177. Yeah, I'm very strong. Remember, it's 23. It's I, just the actual number of the rule is 213. The actual rule is 213. That's the one in, in law. It's 213. Yeah, I've got a copy of it here. Okay. All right. So it's number okay. two. Okay. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So, agenda item 75 SR 2019 213, the Social Security Amendment EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to the rule? No. Okay, no objections. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019 213, the Social Security Amendment EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, move on to the agenda item 76. Agenda item 76, SR 2019, number 90, the Social Security Income Related Benefits, updating an amendment, EU Exit Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. These regulations amend the Income Support, Job Seekers Allowance, State Pension Credit, Housing Benefit and Employment and Support Alliance Regulations, the Income Related Benefit Regulations. Under existing legislation, individuals who wish to claim income-related benefits must have a right to reside and be habitually resident in the common travel area. These regulations clarify that the current habitual residence rules on access to benefits for European Economic Area nationals, Swiss nationals and Zimbrano carers continue to apply whilst they hold limited leave to enter or remain under the EU settlement scheme. As I've stated, the benefits affected are income support, job seekers allowance, state pension credit, housing benefit and employment and support allowance. The amendments clarify that the existing rules on access to benefits for AEA and Swiss nationals remain in place for those granted limited leave to enter or remain under the EU settlement scheme. The amendments also clarify that the existing rules on access to benefits for Sombrano carers remain in place for those granted limited leave to enter or remain under the EU Settlement Scheme. The EU Settlement Scheme is the means by which EEA and Swiss nationals resident in the UK before a specified date are granted a UK immigration status which protects their entitlements and right to remain in the UK. Certain non-EEA and non-Swiss nationals, including Zambrano carers, will also need to apply to the EU Settlement Scheme by the same date in order to confirm their immigration status and rights. Those with fewer than five years continuous residence in the UK will be granted limited leave to enter or remain, also referred to as pre-settled status, 
Those with five or more years continuous residence will be granted indefinite leave to enter or remain, also referred to as settled status. <coughs> okay, members, any questions on item 76? No. 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 Okay. Agenda item 76, 2019 90, the Social Security Income Related Benefits, updating and amendment number two, EU exit regulations, Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to rule? No. no. There being no objections, we'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered 2019-90 the Social Security Income Related Benefits Updating and Amendment No. 2 EU Exit Regulations Northern Ireland 2019 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rules. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, Dorian and Michelle. Um, I think we might see you again next week at some stage, but uh, well, thank you for your assistance. I've been off very lightly. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, hopefully next week you should see us finish off our, our statutory rules. Hopefully. So we'll move on then to agenda item number six, which is any other business. Do members have any other business? Nope. Thank you. We'll move on then to agenda item number seven. Date, time and location of next meeting. Can I advise members that the next meeting of the Committee for Communities will be at 10 a.m. on Thursday the 6th of February 2020 in room 29 Parliament Buildings and is also scheduled for an afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly, Committee Room 29.